So check out this week's project. What a beauty, right? <laughs> this thing is nice. Now this is an armchair, it's got an adjustable back, and a lot of people call it a Morris chair. That's stickly made really famous. It's kind of like the arts and crafts movement. But for me, I think that I changed a lot of those stale designs and I made it more modern because I put a lot of curves in this chair. So you can see on the bottom rails, each one of them has a curve. The arms are curved in both directions. And if you see the back, you can see that it has a really beautiful, elegant curve to it as well. Now, what makes this chair really, really comfortable, for me at least, is that it has a trapezoid seat. Now, what I mean by that is it's wider in the front than it is in the back. Another thing that adds to the comfort of this chair, and it's a throwback to that era, is the foundation. Now, this foundation is called a eight tied nine spring seat, which means it has nine little springs that are tied together really well, which makes a really fluffy spring seat. The cushions are all full of down. It's, in, it's imported Italian leather. And I love the color because I think it complements all the greens in this wood. Now when it came to the back cushion, you can see these lines in it. There are eight battens of down, about six inches, seven inches thick. When you put it in place and sit down in it, oh, the air just kind of dissipate and you sink into it and you relax more and more. And it really is a great feeling to sit in this chair, especially if you make it because, you know, I can check out all my work and I can take pride in my work sitting in it relaxing because look, Woodworking is a tough racket, so when I can build something and chill out in it like this, it makes it all worth it. Whew. But look, we have a lot of work to do today, so let's get to it. The first thing I want to talk about are the legs. I shouldn't have to tell you this, but I'm going to anyways. When it comes to milling material, when you rough mill material, leave it an inch long and a quarter inch wide and a quarter inch thicker than what you need. And then when you need the parts, that's when you buzz them down to final thickness. With our legs, they're two and a half inches square and they're 24 inches long at this point. Another thing you need to be aware of when you're rough milling material is what this project is going to look like. So you can see that I, I agonized and I picked my stock for the front. And this is going to be the left and the right of our project. And I think that it looks beautiful. So what I do is I put these four legs together and I just keep flipping them around until I'm happy with the orientation. And then I take my marker. And since the way that I lay things out is if, uh, as if um, I'm looking at a project. So left is left and right is right. So I'm going to put an L on one and an R on the other one just like this here. And that represents the front. See? Just like that. Now the next thing I needed to do was think about what it looks like from the side. And you can see that the grain on these pieces right here looks really pretty slick, right? So once I have these four pieces in the orientation that I want, I just make a triangle on the top. Just like this, okay? Once I do that, it's just a matter of laying out the inside of where I want my mortises to be. Now obviously these ones are already done, so let me grab a blank and I'll show you how I lay them out. So let's talk about the mortises. Now, we have lefts, rights, front, and backs. And here on my drawing, you can see that I have the backs. We have a short mortise for the back rail. We have a bigger mortise for the side rail. And since we have a bar on our chair, we have this little one right here. All right, and now they're all really pretty simple to lay out because they're centered on the blank and they're a half an inch thick. So the hardest part about doing this is making sure that I mark lefts and rights and I don't screw it up when I go to the mortiser. When it comes to mortising machines, they're all different sizes and shapes. I really don't know what you have to cut mortises. Um, I'm just going to show you a couple of tips and tricks that will help you get cleaner mortises. Now, the first thing you need to do is make sure that your mortising chisel is parallel to the fence. The next thing you need to do is make sure that your mortising drill bit, right, isn't scraping across your chisel. You hear that? Nothing, right? Because otherwise, it's just going to start screeching and you're going to burn the crap out of it. Next is the way that you make the actual mortise, right? Now watch this. You can see if I push on this bit, it flexes a little bit, right? Now that is a major problem because if you just kind of work your way down the stock a little bit, you're just going to keep putting pressure on one side and it's going to either bend this or make it loose or you're just going to create problems for yourself. The next thing you need to do is make sure that your workpiece doesn't move. Now this is a real pain in the neck. You can see that I have clamps 
on the sides that are keeping my fence down. And I have this huge clamp that's keeping my stock against the fence. And I'm going to have this other clamp up against this piece of wood that's going to keep it from pulling up, right? Now, the layout on this um, mortise is all right here in the procedure list. So just do yourself a favor and follow it. But essentially, you're going to come up six inches and mortise out five and a half, all right, for the sides. For the back, you're going to come up six inches and then four and a half. Now, when it comes to that little piece right here, just, just like I said, I think it's two inches up, but just use this procedure list and you can't go wrong. Lefts, rights, ups and downs, right? So let me put these on and I'll show you how I like to make mortises. Like I said, I'm going to clamp this on first. I'm going to wheel this bad boy in. I have the depth gauge set at the appropriate depth. I have it centered on the stock. So now it's just a matter of making my cuts. Watch this. Okay. That's pretty simple. Now, if I just move this over a little bit, I'm hoping that the camera's gonna pick up this flexing. You see that? You see how it moved that way just a little bit? And if I take a little chunk, you can see it moves even more. So this is what you wanna do. You wanna go down the length of your mortise and leave about a mortise chisel width in between, just like this here. Okay, now I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna take this material out like this. So if you look inside here, you can see that it's got a ton of debris and the walls of the mortise aren't very clear. So let me show you what I do to make sure that I eliminate what's going on here. I'm just going to start again with the mortise and chisel. And then I'm going to come up out of the mortise and I'm going to come over just a little bit. I'm just going to work my way the whole way down. It doesn't seem like much, but trust me. It's actually like pairing the mortise, you know what I mean? Because the chisel keeps going down, back and forth. And what I'm doing, I'm just looking at the walls of the mortise to make sure they're starting to get cleaned up. But you got to make sure the chisel comes up out of the mortise, you know what I mean? All right. <laughs> I mean, I know I'm going up and down a zillion times, but trust me, it's worth it. Because look it. You can see that the bottom's super clean and the side walls are nice and straight too. Now when it comes to making mortises, you just need to make sure you have a wicked sharp chisel, it's parallel to the fence, you have a way to lock your work securely in place, and you don't end up working like a donkey. It's time to talk about our leg tenons. Now this right here is probably the most important part of this project, all right? It's because it's right where your hand is when you're sitting down on this chair, and it's absolutely the only thing that people are going to be looking at to see if your craftsmanship is any friggin' good. Now, the reason why it's offset like this and it looks kind of weird, it's because I want to make sure that the side of my tenon is parallel with my arm and it's square to the front. Now, the length of these are basically 23 and three quarters and the back is 22, I think. But listen, just make sure you check your procedure list. The thing that is important is that you need to make sure that you cut the angle on the back. So I went to the drawing, I set my bevel to the angle, went to the chop saw and made my cut. The thing that's really important right here at the uh, saw is that you need to separate your lefts from your rights. I have my lefts marked right here and I have my rights. So I, I marked an inch down and then I set my blade. Next, I grabbed this little gizmo and basically what this gizmo is, it's just an angle block at the angle of the uh, trapezoid seat. It has a right, and a left because I have a left and a right. And the way that it works is that, one, you can't get confused. And I have a right leg and I have the right down. I broke the edges with a piece of sandpaper so my leg will fit in there nice and easy, right? And then, 
I marked a half an inch because that's how big these tenons are. It's just a half inch like shoulder all the way around. And I set the inside of the blade to my line. And now I'm just gonna make a series of cuts. All right, let's check it out. Now you can see that this tenon's offset, you know, from the outside perimeter of the blind. All I need to do is continue on, do the other three legs, and then we can talk about how we cut off all this other material. When it comes to cutting the cheeks, what's gonna happen is I'm just cutting these little pieces off, right? Now, if I just set my fence to an inch, what's gonna happen is these little pieces are gonna get trapped between the blade and the fence, and they're gonna go flying backwards. The way you eliminate that is that you use a piece of wood just like this, all right? So what I did was I put the piece of wood against my fence and then I measured over an inch. Now I can slide this piece of wood back, clamp it to my fence, and I'm gonna use this as a stop and then I can go across the blade safely. Now to cut the back, it's a little complicated because it's on an angle, right? You can see that this depth is shallow and this depth is a little bit deeper. All I'm gonna do is cut these two pieces out of parallel to the rail, and then I'll just clean up these two other sides, you know, at the bench, because it's way easier and faster. All I need to do is just loosen my miter gauge and make sure that the angle is up against that block and repeat the process. Time to make our rails. The first thing we need to do is make our tenons. You can see that we have straight tenons on the front rail and the back rail, but the side rails have an angled tenon. We're going to make the front and back ones first because they're easier. The first thing I want to talk about is the material. When it comes to the material on the rails, what you need to do on a long piece is make sure that you cut the middle of it out for the front so the side rails basically go around and it all looks like one piece of wood. It's really important because when you look at a chair from afar, you want it to just look sweet. These are pretty simple to be totally honest with you. Unlike the, you know, the posts, we're gonna cut the cheeks first. So I have my fence set at seven eighths of an inch to the outside of the blade, and it's set at a quarter of an inch. And it's really, really simple stuff. I'm just gonna cut one side, flip it over, and do both pieces, both sides. cut the cheeks, what I do is I raise my blade to 7 eighths of an inch, I moved it over so I'm taking off just about a quarter of an inch, I'm going to take my board and I'm going to hold it up just like this. Now me, I'm pretty comfortable holding on to it this way and just making a cut, but if you're not comfortable, check this out. Another wicked smart idea, grab yourself a little hand screw and just put it on your board like this here. You need to make sure that it's sitting on top of your fence and since mine is like an inch and a half wide, I feel really secure this is going to be totally safe. So I just gotta grab my gear, 
en México. Okay, so you probably notice I only cut one side of each one of these boards. It's because I want to check the width of my tenon to make sure that it fits inside my mortise. So all I'm going to do, right, is I'm just going to take a little chunk off and then see how it fits. I'm going to grab my chisel and just take this chunk out. Then I'm going to grab the leg or post and I'm going to check it. And I can see that that is still too tight. So basically I'm just going to knock this over a little bit. repeat the process until it's nice and snug inside this um, mortise and then I can cut all my rails. It's a little too tight. Pretty good. For the side pieces, it's basically the same thing, <laughs> but completely different. The first thing is, since it's on an angle, right, I needed to change the angle of my blade, which is two and a half degrees. Now, since I'm doing lefts and rights and I'm trying to control the orientation of my grain because you can see that I have my grain patterns laid out the way that I want them because again I want this chair to look really great from afar. So I'm just going to show you how I do the lefts first. What I'm going to do is I'm going to hold it upright just like before. The front is going to be forward right and the face is going to be out which is this way. To cut the other side I need to do this right here okay. So Unlike the other one where I cut the insides first, I'm going to cut the inside of one side, then the outside of the other, and then I need to adjust the blade. So let me just cut this first one, and then I'll show you what I'm talking about. To get the other side of the cheek cut, really simple stuff. I just measured over half an inch from the inside of my cut. I'm just going to move my fence over until I'm cutting off from the outside of the blade like this here. You see that? Now I'm going to stay a little heavy, cut it, and then again make a test cut. When it comes to cutting the shoulders, you can see right here since it's on an angle, these two points are in different locations. Now what that means for us is that we need to have two different setups here at the table saw. The first cut I'm going to make is basically just like before. I have my block set up, the angle of the blade is still two and a half degrees, it's set at a quarter of an inch, and now since I'm cutting the left, you need to remember that the top is towards Tommy. Not you when you're at home, always think of me. It's top towards Tommy, <laughs> so the top is towards me. I'm going to make my first cut, spin it around, making sure the top is still facing me, and then make my second cut on both pieces. To cut the other side of the tenon, it's the same exact setup, <laughs> except it's on the other side of the blade. Now the reason why I do that is because this blade only you know, goes in one direction, right? All right, so check it out. You can see it's on an angle. I think it looks pretty good. The last thing I need to do is just clean this up right here. Cut a shoulder on it, 
and I know it's going to fit perfectly. <laughs> now let's talk about my favorite aspect of this chair, and it's all the curves. Now, to get the curve of this chair, it starts with the arm blank. Since my arm is three feet long and it's about an inch and seven eighths thick, inch and three quarter, whatever I could get out of a piece of eight quarter, it is what it is. So I need to get a pleasing curve in this particular piece of wood at seven eighths of an inch thick. Now, I thought it would be fun to pay some homage to one of the original guy, mathematicians who was a geometric genius. His name was Euclid. He lived about 300 BC, I'd suppose, and he was really famous at figuring out things that we take for granted today. But I really wanted to show you this because I thought it was a lot of fun. Basically, you can see that I have two points here with nails. That's the length of my arm. And I basically just took a pencil and I drew a straight line. Next, what Euclid discovered was, is if you take two pieces of uh, material that are equal to that length right there, and then you hold it at the desired angle that you need, which for me is 7 eighths of an inch because that's how big my blank is. And if you hold these two pieces of wood on these two points and you grab a pencil or whatever, right? Check this out. And you just, like the hot pot is you just need to make sure that this gizmo is up against those two points. All right, up against the two points. All right, this is going to be so cool. I check that arc out. It is like perfect. Now, believe it or not, this is like the segment of a 30 foot circle. Just imagine if you had to try to lay that thing out. You'd need like three people and a huge line and everything else, right? Now, you don't need to worry about that because we wicked smartly put it right here on the plan. All you need to do is cut out the pattern, stick it to your piece of wood and cut to the line. Another thing that I love about this arc is that I decided to use this everywhere on my uh, chair. So not only is it the side profile of the arm, it's also the top profile and it's the bottom curve of all of the stretchers all the way around the chair. So let me grab a stretcher and show you how I laid it out. You need this right here. So do me a favor, make sure that you do this to the best of your ability. What you need to do is cut the curve off our plan, attach it to a piece of, I'm using three quarter plywood, and I cut the curve and I fared it as best I could. And then I flipped it over and I drew a line again and then I checked it. And wherever it was out, I just took my time and continued to work this curve until it was the best it could be. You know what I mean? Because honestly, this pattern right here is going to be the boss pattern for every curve that's on this project except for the back. Now, it's really simple to transfer this onto all the pieces of wood. Look, it's just a matter of me holding the curve on the bottom, on the two corners right here. Hold it down firmly and strike a line. Then I'm just going to go to the bandsaw. I'm going to cut it and make it sure that I leave the line. Then I'm going to attach my pattern with some screws and flush cut it at the bottom. Finally, I can sit down at the bench and do some handwork. Now is where I need to start to concentrate more, elevate my game a little bit more, and pay attention, okay? Because this is what's important. You can see coming off the table saw that I wasn't able to cut all these pieces off the back legs. So I need to do it with my hand tools. And just like machinery, when I tell you that they need to be in good working order and everything has to be sharp and precise, if you don't have a good hand saw, if you don't have good chisels, and if you don't have you know, the appropriate way of sharpening any of this stuff, you're really gonna struggle. So you need to pay attention to this kind of thing and just learn how to do it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna strike a line. I'm gonna grab a saw and I'm gonna cut this on the angle so I can knock off the remaining pieces of my shoulder or cheek or whatever. You know what I mean? And to be totally honest with you, this doesn't need to be all that precise either because it's going to be covered by that big fat arm. All right. Here we go. Flip it over the other side. And repeat the process. Here we go. All right. And to be honest with you, 
I'm not overly worried about this because I need to come back to this and pair it when I go to fit the arm. I'm just trying to get the bulk of this material off. grab the old trusty chisel and just clean this stuff out of here. Perfect. So basically what you want to do now is just break all the edges, clean it, sand it, and prepare it so all these marks are off it and it's good to go for glue up. And before long it's going to look just like this one here. All right. Let's talk about cutting the rest of the tenons. Now with the back, all I'm going to do is going to hold the tenon to the bottom of the mortise. I'm going to mark it just like this. Then I'm going to take my square. I'm just going to square the line down just like so. And then I'll do the same across the top. All right, now I just need to grab the saw and cut it out. Grab the old sharp chisel. I'm going to tape this material up. You notice I'm just taking a little nibble off at a time? See? If I try to take the whole thing, it would just be way more difficult. All right, that's looking pretty good. The last thing I do is I'm just going to come across the top and just break this edge. on both sides of my tenon. Believe it or not, I can still see through this shaggy hair of mine. <laughs> there, that's pretty good. Oh, look, I can see that I wasn't very accurate with my saw, so I'm just gonna take the rest of this material out too. That's pretty good. I'm gonna take my chisel, I'm just gonna use it like a knife, and just drag it across, see that? I'm just going to take that little bit of material out of there. Okay, that's pretty good. I like it. Looks pretty clean. So let's see how it fits. All right. That's what's awesome about working with this stuff. I can smash it a little bit and not be worried that it's gonna break, you know? So let's take a look. This is the side that I care about right here. And you can see that there's still a little bit of a line right here. So what that's telling me is either I need to trim my tenon or I need to make my mortise a little deeper. And to be honest with you, I think I'm just gonna make my tenon a little bit shorter. Once I do that on this one, I'll do the same thing on the front rail. Those will be done and then when it comes to the side rails, since it's on an angle, I basically just need to clean it up, trim it up, get this little piece of material out of here, you know, until it fits. Once I had all this work done on the tenons and I fit all of my rails, the last thing I needed to do was drill out the hole on the drill press for my pin. It's basically just two inches up. Next, I just broke all the edges of my material and I took all the mill marks off. And what I like about that is that when I'm handling this stuff, gluing it together, it just doesn't cut my hands to ribbons because it's not sharp, right? What I'm going to do first is I'm going to glue the back legs together. Now, I dry fit this one a while ago, so hopefully <laughs> it's going to stay together. <laughs> if not, don't worry about it because look, at, I got the old persuader nearby. So keep your fingers crossed that this goes pretty good. Now, you can still see that I have everything labeled on the inside so I don't get confused. All right, so there we go. So. As always, like I'm looking at the project, left, right, back, the hole, back, the hole. This is the orientation on which it all goes together. So let me grab some glue and just get after it. You don't need a lot of this, okay? And you don't need to panic. You can always take it apart if it don't fit. You can always just grab the persuader. I like to put it on the end of my tenon 
It just makes me feel better. I think it's going to restrict this piece from moving in width. Not that it really does. It just makes me feel better. This is the back. This is going to be seen from the back. That's why there's a curve on it. Come on, baby. Get a little squeeze out. I got a wet rag nearby because I don't like to have glue hang around too long. I used to worry about using a wet rag too, but Phil Lowe taught me that it's not going to damage anything. And the glue is like 50 times stronger than the, than the um, wood fiber, so don't worry about it. Do the other side. Oops, see? No problem. There's nothing worse than trying to get glue snots off when it's dry, right? Put on the tenon for no reason at all. <laughs> on the end, I mean, you know. That's good. All right. Let's see if we can be two for two. Man, I get back to working out. <laughs> All right, that's pretty good. Look, even though it's open right here, don't sweat it. That's why they invented these things. Yeah, that's what I wanted to hear. Perfect. I get a little bit of squeeze out right there. Get the rag and I'll wipe it out. I feel pretty confident that this is going to be square, it's going to be straight, because these are really huge tenons, right? As long as they're tight, I know it's not going to be out of whack. So I don't have to agonize with this right here. But you know, we'll do it for fun. Let's, let's see how good I got. Let's see. What's that say? 34 and 9 sixteenths maybe? Half? Three quarter? Man, it's tough. My eyesight's disappearing. There we go. 34 and 3 eighths. Hey, 34 and 3 eighths. See? Piece of cake. All right. That's it. Now we just need to do the front, let it set up for a little while, do the sides, and then we can talk about putting our arms on. Well, I got all the glue clean off as much as I can. Moment of truth right here. 
you can totally see how this thing is splayed out now, right? You see? That's what I've been talking about. That's what all these, these uh, angled tenons are about. So the back of the seat is narrow and the front of the seat is wide. Now I just got to hopefully put this thing in place without freaking out. All right, it really can't be that easy this time around. But, yeah, this is what I'm talking about. Music to my ears when this thing bottoms out. I know a lot of you guys think that I use a hammer just for effect, but I don't. I use that thing all the time. I, I wail on most of the stuff that I put together. It's the way I work. Now the back set nicely. The front I'm having a problem with because it just took too long to put it together. So you can see it's nice and tight on the top. So you just need to put a clamp here on the bottom and hopefully I'll get that to get tight. See that? Tightened right up on me. Beautiful. The glue squeeze out is a good indication that it's right. I feel pretty good about it. I don't mind using a chisel for taking the glue out of these corners either. The trick is not to mangle it. And that's nice and clean. All right. Grab a couple more clamps, I'll do the other side. <laughs> I might be starting to stress out a little bit now. But this one looks good. I ain't just saying that, it looks good. I'm a little concerned about this one right here at the top. See right here? Come on. Ooh, like butter. That was nice. Piece of cake. I actually feel really relieved. So let me grab a tape. Just for fun, let's see what it looks like. That is 38 and 13 sixteenths. Or for everybody else, three lines before 39. <laughs> let's check the other side. Come on, baby. Come on. That ain't bad. That's 38 and three quarters. You know what? For me, being a 30 second out of square at this point is really totally acceptable. All right, now that this is done, I'm going to double check to make sure all the glue's out here, make sure all the joints are nice and clean, and then we can talk about doing these arms. You know, when it comes to these chairs, it's all about these arms right here. The curve on the sides, the curve on the other side, the curve on the front. You just can't help but to touch this chair all the time. Not only the wood needs to be smooth, you can see I have a live edge on this one, which is really kind of neat. The joinery is really great, so... You know, my wife and my mother-in-law especially, they love to just like, for some reason, just touch us like a worry stone, you know what I mean? And it's just a relaxing aspect of this chair. So up till now, you could have skated, to be honest with you, about the joinery, the modus and tenants and all that stuff, because let's face it, nobody really cares about any of that stuff under your ass. But this right here is very important. You need to elevate your game if you want to execute this at a high level. So I'm going to show you how to do it right now. The first thing we need to do on our arms is cut the blank. So our blank is three feet long. It's as thick as I could get out of uh, eight quarter. So I, you know, typically you just like to be about inch and seven eighths. I think this was like inch and three quarter, which is still okay. And it's six inches wide. You need to make sure, and this is important that it's flat and square on both sides, okay? Make sure your blank is perfect. I have my uh, pattern that I got from the plan and I just put it on the edge like this and made sure that I had enough room and I drew the lines right here on the blank. What I need to do next is cut it right here at the bandsaw. So what I have here is a one inch blade, it's carbide, and what's really important is you need to make sure that your blank is gonna be parallel to the blade, just like this here, you see that? Now this thing throws a ton of dust, so make sure you have proper dust collection I got the little drone over there, which I love. So let me turn it on. Now just take your time and leave the line, all right?
next thing we need to do is flush the front of our arm. Now, if you want to just use the router with say like just a, 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 like a pattern on the bottom, you could see obviously how dangerous this is, right? I and mean, this is definitely not the way to go. So we took the time to make this jig right here. And I swear to God, this jig took longer to make than it did the whole chair, all right? Now, what this jig does, it, it allows me to cut the front and the back. So I'm just gonna show you how I cut the front first. Well, the top of the arm. You can see it's flat on the back. The arm is gonna go right in here like this. I can clamp it down securely. Here we go. And now I have confidence that I can run right over this bit, keeping my hands out of the way. And just as importantly, this piece of material is gonna stay nice and tight in this jig so I'll get a really sweet cut. Well, I survived. You can see I have a little bit to take off in the middle, which is perfect, you know? Now, to do the inside of the curve, it's the same process. I'm just gonna cut it on the bandsaw, and since this jig was made to handle both sides of the curve, I'm just gonna put it in this jig again and do the same thing. see that the base of the chair is all done it's clamped up it's dry and you can really start to see that trapezoid shape now let's talk about the arm right what I need to do is set this arm onto the top of my posts after the router I just cleaned it up and I spent quite a bit of time making sure that these things were really flat and as close to 7 8 as I could get this is the challenge and I always struggle between trying to be super exact on machinery and just trying to avoid using hand tools it never works out for me that way because one, sometimes my milling isn't proper or I might be off on some of my cuts or when I glue things together, they're just not perfect, right? So what I need to do is get these two inside faces of these tenons in line with the edge of my arm. And if I hold this arm up to those two tenons, you can see that there's a little gap right here. And there's a little tiny gap right here. So that leaves me with two choices. Either I need to find the orientation of that tenon and transfer it onto this arm, or I need to make sure that these cheeks are parallel to this edge. And that's definitely the easiest thing in the world to do. But it requires you and me to know how to use something like this. This is called a shoulder plane, and it's wicked, wicked sharp. So I'm gonna make really quick work of this thing. So just watch this. It's only a little bit. So it's probably like a degree, maybe two degrees worth of material that I need to take off. One thing about a shoulder plane is that if you look at the bottom, you can see that how the, the blade can stick out beyond one edge. So you need to make sure 
that it's the other way, like this. See how it moves? Now I want to definitely make sure that that is not digging into my wood. So I'm just going to hold it out a little bit. Good. Now I'm going to come over. I'm just going to take a little swipe off the back end here, making sure that I'm holding it flat to the shoulder because I don't want to tip it. Otherwise, it's not going to give me a true reading of what's going on. Okay. I mean, it's just a little tiny bit. I'm going to try the back. And it may not seem like a big deal, but trust me, this is a big deal because if I didn't do this, you know what would happen? I would break the front end of this because there's a lot of short grain on the end of the arm. All right. So if you come in here, check this out. You can see how I just knocked off this little end right here, this corner. You see that? What I need to do is grab some glue and some tape and put that back on there. I'm tempted to just to keep going and forget about it, <laughs> but since I know this is what everybody's going to be looking at, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to take my time, slow down, and do it right. And it's only a little tiny piece. And it just needs to stay in there a little bit. I'm going to wedge this joint and everything else, and chances are nobody would ever see this. But I see it right now, right? A little piece of tape. There we go. All right. Let me give that a couple of minutes. I can keep working the back one. Now, if you don't have a shoulder plane, that's okay. What you can do is grab a wicked sharp chisel. And basically, do the same thing. Oh, my hair is getting in my way. See? See what I'm doing? I'm going to hold it with my thumb. I'm just going to chip away at it just a little bit. And when I tell you I'm taking off a tiny bit, it's only that little bit. It doesn't seem like much, but it is. I suppose you could use a file, too. Whatever you're comfortable with. But the whole idea is, is that you need to continue to work these two cheeks just give that a minute until my arm is looking good. So look, at, I can see that that is really pretty close right now. And I only took off a tiny amount. And I bet it's because the thickness of this tape is throwing me off. And that's got to be good enough just to hold it. See that? A couple of minutes. Now the trick is <laughs> don't mangle it. I want to take off that little bit of glue. Like I said, like you need to pick and choose your battles when you need to elevate your attention to detail and patience. And this is it. All right, that's looking, that's looking better. Make sure it's in the right orientation. All right, I like it. I like the way that looks. Cool. All right, let me grab my marking gauge. I'm just going to set it to the narrowest part of this tenon. Okay, that's pretty good. So now that I know that this face is parallel to my arm face, I'm just going to make a little tiny scratch mark. You see that? I'm going to do the same to this one. Okay, now that I have those done, it's just repeating the process. I'm going to take my shoulder plane and just nibble this away until that scratch line from the marking gauge disappears. Now that I have these two faces parallel, I want to make these two faces square. Now if I hold my square up to it, you can see that it's just that little tiny amount, right? So I'm going to put my square to the top, right there. I'm going to slide it down. Perfect. I got a little bit overhanging here, but it's right tight there. Just strike a nice line. You can see it right there. 
and now I can grab my shoulder plane and just gingerly work this thing until that line disappears. All right, that is looking pretty good. The next thing I need to do is transfer all this information onto the arm. All right, so basically what I want is a two inch overhang from the front. So I have a mark on there, set it two inches, and I'm gonna hold this at that mark, okay? You can see how it's not square, right? That's why I'm doing this. Because now I can make these marks just like so. I would typically do this with a knife, but I want you guys to be able to see it. Now that I have these marks, let's head to the bench. The first thing I need to do is transfer these marks over to the other side of the arm, right? So I get my square. I'm going to hold it over here. Like so. Oops, I don't need that anymore. Just like so. And then I'm going to do the same to the back. Not only on the top, I also have to do the same thing on the underside. Okay. Do the same down here. One more time. Okay. The next thing I want to do is establish where my arm is going to be sitting, right? And for me, I think three quarters of an inch from the inside edge is good. If it's too much, I can always just hand plant it, but I find that three quarters of an inch is pretty safe. So I got my marking gauge. I set it to three quarters of an inch. Now what I'm going to do is just carefully score a line on the top in between my lines. You got to make sure you have a, like a wicked sharp point on this thing. You know what I mean? There we go. On the underside, I don't really care how big it is, so I just do this. And I think it's kind of cool, because if you, one day when somebody starts to look at all this stuff, they might see my maker's box, you know what I mean? Okay. Now that I have that done, I need to take my square and measure the exact size of my tenon. This is very important, okay? Now, I'm going to err on the side of caution and make it smaller than what this says. Okay, it's just a hair under an inch and a half, so I'll probably just go to 7 16 So from my scratch line, I'll come over an inch and 7 16 I'm going to make a mark with a knife, 7 16 from this mark right here, I can lock it in. Here we go. I'm just gonna make a mark, okay? I'm always tempted to do things like this, is just drag it down, but my knife always moves around. So again, this is always a challenge. I mean, even for me, it's like, I'm challenged to have to do things the right way constantly and consistently. I, I'm forced to slow down. And most of the time, I, <laughs> I don't really need to. But since I know people are going to be looking at this, I want it to be right. Okay, I feel pretty confident that it'll be OK. But I'm going to do it on the bottom side first. Because if I need to make an adjustment, it's not going to be the end of it. You know what I mean? I could have 10 lines underneath here and ain't going to bother me. Measure it. That's pretty good. All right. Now I have confidence that I can do it on the front side without making a huge mistake. And I'm always tempted to make two or three marks, you know what I mean? Like passes, I mean. But one is really all you need. This is just an indexing mark for my, my chisel. Whew. 
Okay, now that that's done, I need to set it up, grab a drill, and poke a few holes in it. Time to drill a hole. Now this is not for the faint of heart, all right? What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this big fat bit, I'm gonna center it on my square, I'm gonna hold it to the angle, and I am just gonna go for it. I don't see my bench, so that's a good sign. I'm gonna take this bit out, and we have a smaller one, and push the envelope even further and do the corners. All right, well that's what it looks like. It's kind of ugly, but now I just have to attack it with a chisel. So let me just do the same thing to the back, and then I'll get to doing that work. All right, now that I got my hair out of the way, the next thing I need to do is grab my square and a knife, and I'm just gonna make a line where the pencil was. And this is the underside, so I'm really not overly concerned about it. Okay, just like that. Next, I'm going to grab my hair protection, put on a little music, because doing this will give you a screaming headache. I'm going to take my chisel, and I'm just going to just tap lightly right now, all the way around. Making sure I'm staying on the same angle that I'm supposed to be. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to drag my chisel over until it index, indexes on the mark from the knife. Tap it in. Tappy tap tap. Okay. Now I'm going to take a smaller chisel and just try to remove that material out slowly. Because what I'm doing is I'm trying to establish a shoulder, in essence, on these marks. The trick is not to go too deep. Perfect. Now that I have the shoulder established around the perimeter, I can more aggressively attack this material. The reason why I have a smaller chisel, it's because it's going to go deeper into the material quicker. If I try to use this big wide chisel, it's just not going to work, see? You're really wailing on it. Now that I have the bottom or the underside of my arm pretty much established, I'm going to flip it over. I'm going to use the other cutoff, secure it into place, and then basically do the same thing, making sure that I don't bruise any of those marks because I don't want it to be too big, you know what I mean? And look, it. I've done this, I can't tell you how many times. So it's kind of like first nature to me to be able to do this kind of thing. But if you've never done this before, it's really important to make sure that you have a good bench, that you have good clamps. You know, you really need to know how to sharpen your chisels because believe it or not, a, a dull chisel is more dangerous than a sharp one, all right? So just make sure you understand what you're doing before you start doing it. Otherwise, you're gonna make all the mistakes I made. 
but I guess that's how you learn, right? <laughs> Hopefully, I won't make a big mistake now. I just talked a bunch of trash. And this is really stressful, to be totally honest with you. So I need to make sure that I, one, establish these lines right here, making sure that I keep good pressure on my square. If you don't, what happens is it, it'll move like this, you know? So just I'm gonna hold it to the inside. And I am really holding this square in as hot as I can. And I'm just gonna lightly make that line. You see that? Now you can see that my scratch line is just inside my, my pencil line. And that's fine with me. I would rather pare it away, pare the material away when I need to, instead of wishing I had it. Put my soft rock back in my ears. <laughs> and now I'm just gonna repeat the process. Take a wide chisel and establish the the perimeter, my shoulder line. Now that's looking pretty good. So next, I need to take it out of the clamps. That's not bad. I'm gonna come over here. I'm gonna hold my vise upright. All right. Now I'm just gonna clean this out a little bit and then I can inspect it with a square. Okay, I'll flip it around. So the last thing I need to do is clean this material. Now I'm going to grab my square blade and show you what I'm talking about. What I need to do is make sure that this side of my blade is sitting tight on this side of the hole and the same thing on the other side that is tight over there. And I can see that I need to take a ton of material out right here. And the way that I do that is I just take my chisel. And I just use it like in a slicing motion, like this here. And I just work my way across the surface like, like this. See, this is what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. and, and doing that allows me to cut a little bit more on the middle than the outside. All right, I think that's looking as close as it can be without seeing if it fits first, right? All right, now let me show you a couple of little tips that I like to do on the tenon before I actually try to fit this thing. All right, now a couple of tricks I wanna show you before you try to set this square onto this one is that you have to remember that you're only gonna see the top of this square. So you can back cut this a little bit like this here, okay? And then you can chamfer these corners like that. It doesn't seem like a big deal, but trust me, it's a big deal. Just remember, you can't do it from the top, right? So you break that a little bit that way, and then you just clear a little of this material out in the middle, back cut it a bit, and that's gonna help you when you go to set this mortise. Let's see how it fits. Look at that. I mean, it's just starting to bite. Now I can see that it's sitting here and here. It looks really good, but it's a little tight on this inside corner. So it just tells me, and I can even see it's a little rounded right here. So I just need to clean out this little section right there. And again, I'm not gonna force this down because I need to do the same thing to the front and push these down at the same time, making sure that I pay attention to all these surfaces. Now look, this took me about 45 minutes to get to this point already. And I still need to do a little bit more work. And I can't fit this completely until I do the other side. Now when it comes to doing this type of work, this is the part of the project where you have to slow down 
and you have to be extremely methodical with what you're doing because like I said, this is the pot that everybody sees. So just make sure that you take your time until this thing sits firmly on both of these tenons. Once you do that, it's just a matter of cutting this awesome curve. The last cuts we need to make on our arm are the profile cuts right here. I think it's a great detail. And basically, I just used the same curve that I used to get the side profile of my arm. I came down 12 inches from the corner, and I came in three and a half inches from the end, and I basically just held those two points, and I drew a line, right? Now, for the front and for the back, I didn't like the way that the, um, the arm was just square. And I kind of went back and forth with this design, and I couldn't figure out what I wanted to do. And then this came to me, this right here. You just hold it in the corner, just like that, and it's straight a little bit, and then it curves on the front and the back. They look different because I'm cutting two and a half inches off of this. Now, the last thing you need to remember is that you have to get the cutoff from the back of the arm to cut this because it's going to stabilize this, this whole arm so it's nice and safe on the bandsaw. couple of things I needed to do to this arm coming off the bandsaw was just cleaning up all the ragged edges left from that huge blade. I did it with um, a spoke shave and a regular hand plane and some sandpaper. Then I took my handsaw and I made these relief cuts right here. Now those relief cuts are for these wedges. I don't really need to wedge these tenons but I just thought that it would be a cool look and something different on this chair. Now these wedges came from the cutoffs that I got from the uh, the front of the, I mean, the top of the arm curve, all right? So really neat, just cut it off, inch and a half wide, and they're already, you know, the shape of a wedge. All right, the moment of truth. I still have my glue and my brush. Now, this one might be a little bit stressful, but not really, because I know that the wedge is going to hold this thing in place forever. The trick is for me is not to put too much glue on it. And with this right here, the glue may just hide maybe some discrepancies in your not so perfect joinery. It helps if there's no sawdust on it. <laughs> there we go. I'm just gonna put a little inside these mortises. Again, you need to take your time and put them both in the same time. I've cracked one of these, so I'm learning my lesson. Here we go. Easy. And I really am holding my breath, hoping that I don't crack the front of it. All right, that's looking pretty good. All right, just a little in there. Grab my wedge. I'm just gonna start these two. Grab the opus weight up. Here we go. I'm just gonna lean on this, making sure that it's nice and solid down on the arm. I mean the uh, the post. You hear that? That's all you need. That's it. Don't smash it in there because you'll regret it. It looks pretty good all the way down. Now I can do the same to the back.
I can hit the back more aggressively because I have way more material on the back end of it, so I'm really confident it's not going to break. But that sound tells the story, right? I'm going to grab my throwaway saw and cut them off. I don't know why I call it my throwaway saw because I never throw it away. <laughs> That's good. All right, now that I have this done, I just need to let this glue dry a little bit, and then I'll show you how we put the chamfer on the top. The final detail on this tenon right here is to make it look sweet coming through the arm. Now, you can see this piece of wood right here is basically just a little bit over an eighth of an inch, I mean a sixteenth of an inch, and I cut a little section of it out so it goes right around my tenon. Now, what I need to do is take my time again and remove whatever material is high using this little tiny plane. And don't be tempted to pick up an orbital sander and do this because otherwise you're going to round the crap out of it. Or <laughs> you're going to buzz this down and it's going to be smaller than you want and by the time you get to the fourth one it's going to be tiny. That's pretty good. And these, like honestly, this thing makes quick work of it if you know how to use it and it's sharp, right? Okay. That is looking pretty good. All right. I'm just going to look around the edge, make sure it's good. I trust my eyes so I can just nip away at the parts I think are high. You can use this to check to make sure there's no high spot in the middle. You can see there's a little high spot right there in the middle. So I just knock it down like that. Okay, next I'm going to take some masking tape that's over here. So I'm going to put my piece of masking tape right next to the tenon like this. And I'm going to take the body of my combination square and I'm going to hold it up. Now you can see that there's some light between this and that. That's telling me that my wedges went beyond where I wanted them to. So I just have to take this little piece of this wedge off. All right, it's not bad. Let's use my shoulder plane. So I got a little tiny shoulder plane too. This thing's awesome. Okay, so I'll take those off. Now, what I'm doing is I'm just going to go across, taking these little pieces off until the body of my plane is up tight to my tenon. Now I know that I have those wedges out of the way. I'm going to hold the body of my combo square up tight to it, like this here. Then I'm just going to take the blade, because the blade is just over, is like the perfect dimension, you know what I mean? And none of this is like, you can just lay out whatever you want, you know? Like, this is what I decided to do, just because these are the tools that I had, and it, it just makes it easier. And I think looking at a lot of this furniture from back in the day, they basically did the same thing, you know what I mean? They had the tools they had, and they did what they did with what they had. The first couple times I did this, I didn't bother to put a line around it, and it looked horrible. So, again, there's another lesson on just slowing down a little bit and doing it right. And the older I get, the easier it gets too, you know? Okay, now you can see that line all the way around. I can grab my little square, I mean, <laughs> I can grab my little plane here, make sure the blade's up out of the way, like this. 
and just yeah, let's put it over here. There we go. The reason why I have the masking tape is because I don't want to scratch the wood with the plane. And I'm just gonna go back and forth until I take that line. And I'm kind of just holding at a 45 degree angle. You know, I think over time you just get you, you just get used to using these things, right? Now I'm looking at the side over here because you can see on my plane that I have the blade away from the corner. The reason why I have it this way is because I'm up on an edge like this and if I had it right in line with the body of the, of the plane, I would scratch the crap out of this arm. So that's why it's up high. That looks pretty good. Do this one since I'm sitting right here, hopefully. Change the blade this way. And can you imagine how much work goes into this little tiny detail? Nobody would believe you. <laughs> Trust me. If you did all this work and you tried to explain to anybody who just didn't realize what was going on, they wouldn't believe how much effort went into making this little tiny thing cool. And since it's on a curve, you need to make sure that you pay attention to that curve. All right, that's pretty good. I got to get off the old throne, come over here and just continue to repeat the process all the way around. All right. You know, that's pretty close. Take the tape off. You know, I think that it looks really good. Now, I always err on the side of caution so I don't take everything off right down to the arm. I'll come back with a little chisel and clean that up. But the most important thing is, to be honest with you, is to make sure that your chamfer is the same distance all the way around the top. And I think that it looks awesome. The last piece of the puzzle for the base of this chair are these little brackets right here. There's one in the front and one in the back. They're both different sizes, so just make sure you cut the right patterns, all right? Now, basically, it's just going to go in place like this. Now, if you've ever had the experience of trying to glue something on like this, you know that it drifts all over the place. So look, I got a wicked, wicked smart tip right here for you. I'm going to hold it upside down. I'm going to grab my brad gun, okay? And I'm just going to put a brad in it. Two of them, really. One, two. Then I'm going to grab my nippers, all right? And I'm going to cut the brad off really close to the surface like that. I've already got a mark set at 3 quarters of an inch, which will center this bracket on the, on the uh, arm, or post, I mean. I'm going to hold it right where I want it to be, and I'm going to press down on those brads. Now what this does is it's going to index, it indexes this piece of wood, so when I put glue on it, it ain't going to go all over the place, you know what I mean? So now I have it where I want it, I'm going to grab a little bit of glue, put it on there with a couple of clamps, and that's it. Just make sure you don't run your finger over these brads. Otherwise, your glue's gonna be a different color. <laughs> All right. All right, that's it. The base is done. Time to wrap it up. Now I have given you all the information you need to know how to build this chair. Now when it came to the back, it's the same exact techniques except smaller. Instead of half inch mortise and tenons, they're quarter inch mortise and tenons. We did the mortises in the, in the arm posts, we did the tenons on the slats, we cut the curves on the slats. We also flush cut them on the router table, cleaned them up, glued it together just like the base, and this is what it looks like. We even put the hole in the bottom of it so it can swivel on the pivot, all right? Now, when it came to a finish, 
what I like to do, obviously I'm not going to put finish on this thing because it's incomplete, but I like using just a simple polyurethane that I cut in half with 50-50 mineral spirits. And I just want to show you the beauty of this wood because it's really the essence of this project. And I say it all the time. If you choose the right material and you pay attention to the grain direction while you're building it, you are going to be astonished at what you can create. All right, now watch this. I'm just going to start at the top and work my way down. Huh? Look at that. I mean, it's gorgeous. It's orange. It's green. It's brown. It's black. It's everything. And this piece of wood looks beautiful just by itself. But when you create a project out of all this stuff, it looks really beautiful once it's completely done. Well, <laughs> here it is. This thing is amazing, right? I mean, all the colors really pop. For the finish, I just continued to build layers until I was happy with the way that it felt. Now, these arms are going to get a ton of wear, so I just put more on the arms than I did the back. When it came to these cushions, I really tried to pay attention to what the grain was telling me. And to me, all these greens really were the thing that stuck out. So that's why I ordered green leather for this chair. And I think that overall it looks really great. Now, when it comes to woodworking and being a woodworker, if you're like me, you buy a lot of material and sometimes it hangs around. You don't know what to do with it, right? But once I decided to build this chair, I knew I had enough material to build two of them. So I really paid attention to what was going on at the very beginning with the wood and the rough. So you can see that I have a pair of chairs. They have different colors of leather on them but they look great as a pair. And I think that they will complement anybody's living room. And trust me, when I tell you that this thing is comfortable, it is comfortable. Yes. Let me tell you something. I hope I taught you something today, and I hope you had a great time, and I hope that you really do build this chair, because if you do, you're gonna take a lot of pride in what you built, just like I do. Take it easy.